Hi, everyone. Welcome to the uh, planning for 2022 webinar. Uh, we'll be getting started here in just a couple minutes we'll, as everybody trickles in. We appreciate you joining us on, I almost called this Wednesday. It is definitely Tuesday, October 26th. All right, I think it's safe to get started here. So like I said, welcome everyone uh, and good almost afternoon to our webinar. My name is Mary Verano and I am the marketing coordinator at Corrigan Krause. Thank you for taking the time to join us as we talk about planning for 2022. Our goal today is that you will walk away with a deeper understanding of what nonprofits can do today so that you can grow tomorrow. Before uh, we get started here, I want to go over a few housekeeping items. I am actually not going to be the moderator today. My esteemed colleague, Caitlin, will be handling the panelists today, which is wonderful. Uh, before I give Caitlin the reins, I just want to make sure that all of you are aware we expect this to be an interactive discussion. So use that chat feature, use the Q&A uh, button up there to ask questions of our speakers. I will wave as um, non geeky as I possibly can to get uh, Caitlin's attention so she knows we have a question up there. Uh, this webinar is being recorded and this PowerPoint will be distributed to all of you today. And uh, if you wanna go ahead and let us know if you want to sign up for our newsletter as well, every month we send out a, a newsletter specific to our nonprofit clients and uh, colleagues. So this uh, is now Caitlin's time to shine. Caitlin, can you introduce yourself? Thank you, Mary. Good morning, everyone. My name is Caitlin Dorsch. I'm a senior manager here at Corrigan Krauss. I'm leading up the nonprofit niche with Al and my colleagues here. Um, Corrigan Krauss has a core group of consulting, tax, um, and financial experts here. And our goal is to not only help you with um, you know, your compliance aspects, but help you with managing the full gamut of um, running your nonprofit and all the things that come with that. So happy to be here. Great. Thank you, Caitlin. All right, we have uh, Corliss Taylor here today from Raymond James. Corliss, can you uh, go ahead and introduce yourself? Thank you so much, Mary. It is a pleasure to be here. I really appreciate the opportunity. I'm very excited and happy to be with the panelists. I'm from Raymond James Trust. I'm the trust consultant and charitable specialist for the trust company, talking about trust, estate, and charitable planning with advisors and their clients. Thank you so much again. Great. Uh, and joining Corliss and Caitlin today are also uh, Al Harsar and Alex Ferrara, uh, both from Corrigan Krauss. We'll go ahead and start with Al. Al, please introduce yourself. Okay, good morning, everyone, and thanks again for joining us. Al Harsar, I'm one of the directors here at Corrigan Krauss. I have specialized and worked uh, in the not-for-profit area for many years and uh, happy to be a part of today's discussion. Thank you, Al. Alex. Good morning, everyone. Alex Ferrara here. I'm an insurance manager here at Corrigan Kraus. Coming up on one year next week at CK. Uh, I've been in public accounting my entire career, nine years. And in those nine years, I've always been part of the nonprofit niche. It's just something that I'm very passionate about. I think nonprofits bring so much value and purpose into our communities and the people inside of our communities. So every opportunity I have to give back, um, even if it's not-for-profit accounting, volunteer work, whatever it is, it's it's very important. And I'm, I'm excited to be here today and share some insight as well. Great, thank you, Alex. All right, today is all about planning for nonprofits and uh, what actionable steps you can take today. So Caitlin, take it away. Thank you, Mary. Um, so as we kind of brainstormed what our nonprofits are thinking about uh, looking towards the future and, and our planning, there were kind of three topics that came to mind. Um, thinking about donations and our year-end solicitations and what does that look like um, in today's world, thinking about our budgeting and also thinking about succession planning. And so um, we're starting with Corliss here and talking about donor advised funds. Um, this is often something that we talk to individuals about, but I think it's a really good opportunity for our nonprofits to also understand these and how, how they can um, speak to their donors about these. So uh, Corliss, are you able to tell me a little bit about what a donor advised fund is? 
Absolutely. And I agree. Donor advised funds have become one of the fastest growing charitable vehicles in the industry. In a nutshell, from a 30,000 foot view, a donor advised fund is a pool of money that clients contribute to. They get the immediate tax deduction. They have this money set aside for charitable giving to their favorite 501c3 entities. And the money that they contribute is invested until they decide when they want to make these grants over to the 501c3. It is a very convenient, streamlined, and client-friendly way to do charitable giving. The reason I believe that donor advised funds have become one of the most popular choices in charitable giving vehicles is because it offers the flexibility for the client to accomplish about, I'd say 95% of their charitable goals in this one account. Very easy to use. That's great information. So it sounds like if a donor um, were to give uh, Raymond and Raymond James, they're, they're put into a donor advised fund. This is held under Raymond James, but they still have some control over it for these grants in the future years. Is that correct? That's correct. And that's a great question. And thank you for allowing me to just talk a little bit about the, the specifics, the particulars. Why I think this is important for nonprofits. Individuals use it. Like I said, clients have been drawn to this. It's very popular. But nonprofits can use this as a teaching tool to educate clients, prospective donors, current donors, about the ease of giving back to the nonprofit. So I think it's very, it's incumbent upon the nonprofit to think about this donor advised fund, think about ways to educate their donor base and use the simplicity to win over more prospective donors. And with that being said to your question, Caitlin, yes, if the client opens a donor advised fund account. So let's say the nonprofit has the board of directors or those that are very intimately involved with the nonprofit talk to clients and prospective donors and current donors about using a donor advised fund. When you open one up with Raymond James Charitable, which is a full arm of Raymond James Trust, which is a subsidiary of Raymond James, then the client remains the donor advisor. So yes, they open the account with us, the flexibility is we make it very easy, online application, client opens up, funds the account, gets the tax write-off, but they can decide when they want to say, Raymond James Charitable, send this grant out. The flexibility in this account is really second to none. The client can get, the, we, we have a tagline, deduct today, decide tomorrow. It's really the client that decides when they want the grant to go out. That's awesome. And that sounds like a really good planning opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, and so with today's um, standard deduction, I think that might be a good opportunity when you have a bigger piece that you would like to put into the donor advised fund, let's say, you know, a larger dollar amount, because then they get the deduction and really get the personal tax benefit today um, with the flexibility for the future. Is there a minimum threshold that are required? Like, you know, could somebody put 500, 5,000, 10,000, are, are there levels that we need to worry about when we're thinking about these? All of those are great points. Our minimum account size at Raymond James Charitable is $10,000 to open a donor advised fund. We're trying to keep it in the price point that would be attractive to clients, donors, nonprofits, prospective donors. And in the industry, you'll find it's about $5,000 to $10,000 to open a donor advised fund account. Somewhere around there is the sweet spot. And when clients think about, to your other point, Caitlin, the standard deduction is very attractive. It's $12,000. So why would a client consider opening a donor advised fund account? A couple of really quick points on that. The standard deduction, $12,000, single, $24,000, married, filing, joint. If you're thinking about itemizing, and our minimum account size is $10,000, you can stack a little bit more, add a little bit more to your charitable giving if you know you're going to give back, which most of our clients do, most of the donors for nonprofits, they're charitably inclined. And that way it can get you over the $10,000 minimum, 
$12,000 standard deduction if you contribute $13,000 or $12,001, however you want to look at it, right over the threshold, then you can pull in other items that you can itemize. So you funded your charitable giving with this streamlined vehicle, plus you can take advantage of itemizing if you so choose to. And that, that charitable deduction, you get it today. But if you cannot use all of the contribution to write off on your tax return, you get to carry it forward for an additional five years, effectively giving you six years to write off that contribution, which is great. Wow, I, I, I hadn't realized before that um, you kind of had five years to think through that. So that's really great that um, you could, you know, do your research on your nonprofits. And as a nonprofit, you can really um, advertise because there are all of these donor advised funds, you know, from up to a few years ago, still waiting to be um, granted or gifted out also. Mm -hmm. um, so as a, as a donor, what happens to the funds once they become part of Raymond James Charitable in a donor advised funds? Do they, do they get invested or, or what, what goes on from there? Ah, ooh, I love that question. Because that, I think, Caitlin, that's the number one question that I get. Why would I open a donor advised fund as opposed to stroke the check and just give it to my favorite charity? And the answer that I love to give is exactly what you just asked me. The funds are invested. And with our business model, we allow the financial advisor to work with their client to continue to run the investment. And let's say we get a client that doesn't have a Raymond James financial advisor. That's okay too. Then we have experts that can say, well, these are the investments that we have here are the differences between them. And you get to choose between mutual fund models, stocks, bonds, you can choose the portfolio at a, so we have two platforms of investing. One is mutual fund models, which have been performing great sideline. And the second is the investment advisor, the financial advisor chooses what they want. I want this stock, I want these bonds. So when you contribute to a donor advised fund, the idea here is instead of stroking the check, and Caitlin, I, I have this little joke that we say over here, friends don't let friends give cash. We don't do it. So we want you to invest in the donor advised fund because then your assets, you give a dollar today, theoretically that dollar is growing and you'll have a dollar and 10 cent to give back to 501c3 charities tomorrow. So that's the idea. You put the money in, get the tax deduction and the funds are invested. And that is the attractive point, or one of the attractive points for the donor advised fund. I really like that. And I really like that there's an opportunity to kind of choose your investments or, or what your comfort level is with that money you've given also that it's not, you know, kind of just blindly going in um, if that's the way you choose. So we have a pretty good concept of um, kind of the tax benefits and how that helps the individual and the donor. Um, is there anything else to add to that? Absolutely. Thank you. It's the, the succession planning on a donor advice fund is something that I love to talk about so clients can remember. The donor advised fund is not just convenient, streamlined, all those things are wonderful, but I believe the best benefit is it can preserve your charitable legacy for years to come. How do we do that? Two ways. One, the client is giving back currently, that's great. Now, the succession planning of that is a huge benefit because they can, the client can continue to give upon their death they can leave that donor advised fund to their children, their best friend, succession planning, an individual donor advisor. And the second option, if the client does not want to name an individual to step in and start giving back to those 501c3 charities they so desire to give to, the client can leave what we call a legacy giving recommendation form on file. That file is what we call, quote unquote, controlling from the grave. The client can say, Raymond James Charitable, we want you to give X amount of dollars to Y charities in this frequency as long as you can, as long as the funds are there and these funds are growing, invested, you have them give this back. And what has the client done? The benefit is they can continue their charitable legacy for many, many years. That is an extremely good benefit of using the donor advised fund. Another thing, and I think that's also dovetailed into the question here, best ways to educate donors about donor advised fund. 
The first question to ask is, and I think Alex said, said this really well in his introduction, he loves giving back. He's giving back, it's important to him, any opportunity that he has, he wants to give back. Well, ask your clients that, your, your donors, your prospective donors. Is your charitable legacy important to you? Is it important to continue to give and serve those around you to push the missions forward? The best way to educate the donor is to ask that question. And then when they give you their answer, which probably is going to be yes, talk about how easy it is to use the donor advice fund to continue that legacy of giving, supporting, contributing, pushing the mission forward. That's the way to educate. That's the first way to get, I think, into the conversation with the donors and the prospective donors. Thank you so much for that, Corliss. And I, I couldn't agree more. And I think um, something that so uniquely ties the nonprofit industry together across accountants and across Raymond James and across the people who are out there doing the work is just the passion behind it. And if there's a way to leave a, leave a legacy behind in what you're doing, I mean, I think that really drives people's purpose. So mm -hmm. I couldn't agree more. Thank you for that. So um, at this point, I think we'll move on to Alex and we'll start talking a little bit about our um, budgeting here. Uh, just real quick, Corliss, could you tell us if, if people would like to um, talk to you about uh, setting up a donor advised fund? How do we reach you? Um, what would be the best way to do that? Yes, thank you. It, you can email me at C-O-R-L-I-S-S dot T-A-Y-L-O-R at RaymondJames.com. Corliss dot Taylor at RaymondJames.com or you can feel free to contact me directly on my phone number. If you Do you want me to provide that as well, Caitlin? I don't sure. mind. It's in my, my direct line, 727-567-4704. I'm happy to entertain questions or help point you in the right direction for getting this fun donor advice fund open. Awesome, thank you so much. Thank you. Alex, as we start to talk about budgeting, I know a lot of our nonprofits are on fiscal years. Um, not all of them are 1231 year ends, kind of different from our, our typical um, business model here. But I still think it's important that we look at um, how we're budgeting, when we're budgeting, and what does this look like. Um, can you tell me a little bit why our budgets are non our, our budgets are important for our nonprofits? Yeah, happy to do so, Caitlin. So. Budgets in general, um, big proponent, whether it's an individual budget for yourself, your family, up to large corporations, back to smaller non-for-profit entities, it really gives you the opportunity to manage your resources to the best of your ability, manage your cash flow throughout the entire year. If that's a fiscal year, June 30th client or a calendar year, 1231-21 client, really allows you to just stay in line with achieving your goals and following your mission, just to set yourself up for just overall better financial health. Thank you for that. I really agree. I think the more that we run our nonprofits kind of like businesses in some senses in the background, um, the more we, we find ways to achieve, um, you know, success in new ways. And so um, as far as where we start, so a lot of our clients have budgets. Um, where do we start and, and how do we start deciding on what a budget should look like and, and how we do that? I think the first and most important thing is just taking a look at historical facts, what's happened two years ago, what happened in these last 12 months of our entity, and then just looking at upcoming expectations going into that new year. So if we are a calendar year client getting close to year end here, 12, 31, 21, you know, now's that time to, to work with your internal staff, uh, executive director to kind of work on a budget going forward based on what has happened in the last year, what happened in the last year and a half. You know, do we anticipate uh, large revenue streams coming in the next upcoming year. And I think the most important thing is, is starting with our revenue piece. What are those expectations for you know, potentially fixed grant income? How many do we have quarterly fundraisers? And just trying to do our best to annualize that over the entire year. That operating budget, as we all know, should probably be on a month by month basis. And doing so will allow you to really break out that revenue stream over the entire year. And then same thing on the cost side, looking at those fixed costs, annualizing them, January to December or on your fiscal year end to make sure that you have the resources, the cash available to really be able to, to do the best to, to continue to achieve those goals, be in line with your, your mission and just continue to push forward and grow as a not-for-profit. 
Thank you. That's great information. I always um, kind of joke that when you're building a budget, you're kind of building like maybe five or six budgets, right? Like we know what it's going to cost for all the people just to open our doors and have them, you know, in the office. And then it's like, okay, well, how much are we going to raise in fundraising? And okay, so we know what event we have. Well, how much money is this event going to bring in? And how like each, but each event is probably its own budget. And so we're kind of looking at many different pieces to build together the whole the whole picture. So I think that's great information. Um, and so when when we're talking about budgeting, um, that's kind of our short term budget, right? Like our next year. But should we be thinking longer term? Should we be looking at long term budgets? I mean, is it just next year or should we be thinking sometimes three or five years or under di different circumstances? Yeah, I think, like you said, your short-term budget is more of your operational budget. What are we, what do we do this last year? What are our goals in this upcoming year? But, and I think in order for us to grow in, in all that we do, we kind of always got to look to the future and where do we want, where do we see ourselves three years from now, five years from now? And some of those smaller nonprofits might not have the ability to, to grow, um, but some of our larger not-for-profits, I've, I've seen a few capital campaigns that have stretched out three to five years where that budget's going to look a lot different from your operational budget. Know, strategic plans that might be in place. You know, if you're a not-for-profit that's just starting an inception and you have the anticipation of growing significantly over the next three to five years, that that budget is not going to, we're not going to do that on a month-by-month -month basis. That's just an annual big picture looking at things from a broader lens. Um, but yeah, the three and five year conceptually, it's pretty similar to your operational budget. It's just kind of broadening your horizons a little bit and looking down the road where are we at now? Where can we see ourselves in the next three to five years? And we see a lot of capital campaigns. If you know, if you have um, uh, an orchestra, a symphony orchestra, and you know they want to expand their theater, capital campaign can be can be ran just to continue to to grow that not for profit and, and continue to give back to the purpose of, of that that not for profit and providing value to the the community that they live. In. Thank you. I agree. We do have we have quite a few clients right now um, working on capital campaigns and and completely redoing their entire operations and rethinking how they're doing things. I mean, if COVID has taught us anything, it's that nothing is consistent and that we need to constantly reassess how we're doing things. And so those longer strategic plans are, are really coming into play now. And, and how do we reinvent ourselves? And I definitely agree with you there. Um, so Thinking kind of back to our one year budget, um, one of the big pieces that we've been talking lately is our expenses. And I know that we need to classify them between um, our program expenses, our, our management and general expenses and our fundraising expenses, if, especially in like our financial reporting and in our tax returns and things like that. Is this something that we should be considering um, also in our budgeting or should we not worry so much about that? Well, I think functional expenses are very important uh, for our financial statements and our 990. But in regards to the budget per se, I don't think it's necessary to break break out our expenses on those three different functional expenses: our program service expenses, our GNA expenses, and our fundraising. I think it's definitely very important for the accounting staff internally to have a good understanding of that because it really allows you to kind of use your, you know, if you have gap financial statements and you know your public knowledge of your 990. You really use it as kind of a marketing tool to receive donations um, from out in the general public. But in regards to our, our general operating budget, I don't think we need to break it out per se between those three expenses. Awesome. Um, so what I hear you saying kind of overall here is that um, look at our expenses, look, look at our fixed revenue streams, um, think about our strategic and long-term planning um, and kind of just trying to break it break it down granularly, but also look at the whole picture. Um, and so once we make our budget, um, something that's kind of funny that we see sometimes is like, when we're looking back, we see that the budget is almost the same as the actual. So is it our recommendation that once you create the budget that you kind of update those projections in the budget as you go, or do we just make it and say, what happened happened? What happened happened. I always say, if if you if uh, a random, you know, grant that wasn't anticipated to come in, you know, five hundred thousand dollar grant from a or a, a donor that had something set up that you didn't know, 
that's great. That's a variance in your budget. And that's amazing. Do we anticipate that coming in next year? If we do, then we could potentially have that part of our budget next year. If we're just constantly changing our budget, um, it's constantly changing our goal, essentially, and having that budget in place and just looking at it at the beginning of the year when we made it to the end and just look at that variance um, is the most important thing. So try our best not not to change our budgets, even though it's something that we all typically want to do. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely agree. I, I think we like to be good at our estimating and maybe changing our budget makes us look that way. But um, I, I think we lose an opportunity to see how well we have budgeted in the past if we're constantly changing that and see how well we have estimated and then kind of lose that perspective going forward and in, in our estimating going there. So I think that's awesome information. I know this is something you work a lot on our clients with Alex um, and we do as well. So um, there's definitely an opportunity if you're not really doing great budgeting or you need help. Um, I think there's definitely opportunity there to reach out and get help um, and get some professional opinions on that also. So with that, um, we will talk to Al. And so Al hasn't told us yet, but he has tons of board experience. Um, so I think he is an awesome person to talk to talk about too um, in regards to succession planning. And so Al, can you talk to me a little bit about what a nonprofit should be doing to build their board? Sure, and thanks, Caitlin. Yes, I do uh, devote some good time to sitting on several boards and they're all different kinds of boards and they give me different energies. So uh, I like being a part of all of that. You know, when we think about a not-for-profit, you know, there is no ownership, there's no equity in a not-for-profit. Not for what you have is a trust, a board of trustees, you know, trusted individuals, that are sit there, they're charged with governance. So selection of setting up your board is critical to the mission. So what you wanna do when you're talking about establishing a board is, you know, define the role of the board, the board members, you know, define their financial commitment and what is needed from them. Uh, as you're, you know, and define their expertise that they can, uh, give to the board and you know, ultimately to the mission of the 501c3. You know, they have the ability to you know, reach out then to their network referrals as you continue to want to build that board. So what you're doing is getting good sound referrals from people that you already trust. And then once you have, um, so let's say that you have an established board and you're adding board members it's important that you have a committee and that you interview prospective uh, board members, you know, make sure that they understand, you know, the mission, make sure that they have the commitment, both financially and uh, the time commitment. And I think that's how you build the best board for your organization. Thank you for that, Al. Um, I couldn't agree more. And so, when we look at boards, some of our clients have boards of 10 or less, and some of them are upwards of between 30 and 40. So like, what, what is our ideal size for um, today and long term? Is, is a bigger board better? What, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, let's break it down. So, you know, at a minimum, every board for every organization should have at least three members. You know, you're going to need a president, a vice president, and a secretary just just for proper protocol and the ability to make decisions. Um, I think that, you know, and also I would recommend no matter what size you choose for your board that you try to keep it to an odd number of voting members. Again, you don't wanna have, uh, you, you always wanna have a majority vote on all issues. That's the whole purpose of a board is to discuss, to understand, to vote and to set policy. Um, as far as the number um, of members for a board, I, I'm, I've all, I'm always of the, uh, uh, the thought that really uh, do what seems comfortable and then add a few more. You know, there's, there's several reasons to have a few more. You're gonna want expertise in different areas. You're gonna want, again, financial commitment, network, uh, networking. So I think that, you know, you might decide that three is enough. You have a small organization, you have a small board, and you might have some advisors that lend in along with maybe the executive director joining in for discussion purposes. Uh, on the other hand, you might have um, a very active uh, 501c3 that has several aspects, different programming, 
things that you're going to have a lot of committees on and you're going to want to have a, a, a bigger, stronger board that can help to sit on and chair committees and can also, again, help with the direction of the board. So the sky's the limit, but, you know, keep it reasonable plus a little extra. That, that, that's how I like to say it. I think that's great advice. And that leads us into our next question. Um, so you described um, in looking for a board member that you want somebody um, with who understands the mission, right? And, and um, probably is passionate about that mission with you and also has some of the financial resources um, because of a lot of the responsibility of the board is um, <clears throat> fundraising or, or helping with the mission in some capacity. Um, are there any other kind of, who else should be on the board? Who are we looking for yep. to make up our board members? Right. We've talked about, again, the strong commitment to the cause, and, and that's for sure, uh, and promoting the mission and the programming. But what you also want to look for is, um, you know, for a board, you want to make sure that you have different different disciplines. So every board is going to need somebody in finance. You know, we're, we're financial people here, and uh, that's something that, you know, every board needs help with. Um, marketing and development is critical. So, you know, when you're thinking of board members, think of people that are, you know, able to market. Uh, whether whether it is that they're true salespeople or they might potentially be a well-connected individual in the community, look at business leaders. You know, business leaders help. Uh, you know, they're they're used to being entrepreneurs. They're used to leading a for-profit business. They are fantastic board members, and anyone else that might fit your mission or your board style that can that can lend into the cause. Thank you. Um, and so maybe I missed it there, but um, I often see that there are a lot of um, committees under the board, but not necessarily board members. Um, right. And this is so is that um, something that you see commonly with the organizations that you serve? It's a great point. So what you want to try to do always is, you know, normally uh, most nonprofits will have a board member chair a committee uh, because they're the direct pulse and they'll respond back to the board with what the committee is doing. It's a very good thought pattern to have uh, members of the community that, you know, help and sit on a committee and, and uh, they're not on the board, but what they're there to is to give their time and talents in a different way to help either you know make introductions or again in in the when you're talking about fundraising or something of that nature you know they might have experience in that area so right you want to always have and it's probably best to just have one possibly two in the development area board members sitting on a committee but think about those others that aren't there they might want to join at some point so it's a good uh, testing ground for other other people that are not on the board to sit on a committee Thank you, that's an awesome perspective. And so um, as we look at, you know, how many people should be on our board and what makes up a good board member, um, one of the things that we're, we're talking about today is kind of the succession planning and I guess how to keep a good board and how to roll that to the next group of people. And so um, what are your thoughts on why that's so important to our nonprofits? Sure, you need to address and develop future leadership. So again, you, you, that doesn't just happen. You know, boards are, again, they're not like a business ownership where you can own your business for 50 years. You know, you have to think about the fact that, you know, any well-run board should have some kind of a, a term limit, whether it's, you know, two, three-year sessions, three, three-year sessions, something for the board members. Again, you want to always get fresh ideas in there. So, you know, again, address and develop future leadership. Um, both financially and strategically. So again, as you're looking to succession, make sure that you are uh, looking at uh, not only specific individuals out there, but who and what you need in order to continue to grow and accomplish the mission. Another thing I wanted to point out when you talk about board succession, and it, it is so important, you know, boards will always, uh, they'll sit down and they'll do a great plan and they're looking at, okay, let's talk about you know, what we want to do in the future. Well, you do have to consider a plan for a sudden or unexpected departure. You know, you can have a strong board with, you know, a couple of strong uh, members leading it. And if one of those leaders falls ill or has to leave because of moving or work purposes, 
you know, you're, you're, you're down some intelligence, you're down that know-how, the people that are connected with the mission. So again, always plan for that, that kind of sudden departure and have that in your book as far as, and in your plan as far as how to uh, accomplish the continuity of the board. Thank you, Al. So I, I, what I what I hear you saying is maybe don't put all your eggs in one basket, right? Kind yeah, of build a group of a great. few experts in the same same area just so you're play. prepared. Um, and so when we're thinking about kind of shorter term and longer term, it sounds like shorter term we're thinking about who are we getting on the board, who are we recruiting, you know, who's kind of helping with certain missions, and then what are our longer term succession planning thoughts? So for long-term succession planning, you know, focus more on the strategic, on a strategic plan for the organization. Where is the organization going and what are the future needs of the organization? I think that that's the best thing you can do when you're looking at planning for um, um, people to sit on the board is, you know, understand, uh, you know, I think every board member, especially over time, will understand the mission, but you know, how to extend the mission, how to, how to uh, increase, you know, maybe your community involvement or, um, you know, are, are there capital, capital programs that are going to be put into place? So I think that that's, that's more so your longer term succession planning is, you know, have that next level person there and a part of the, um, the, the current board and all, uh, so that, uh, as people fall off, you have backups that are readily available. Thank you, Al, for that. And um, when we look at our board succession planning, I think that kind of top executive management of our nonprofits really is very integrated with our board, right? They're often attending the meetings, reporting the happenings, kind of leading the day-to-day -day operations. Um, and so when we don't say, when we say don't put all your eggs in one basket for the board, is that also true for our staff? And how do these things kind of work together in, in our succession planning? Yeah, succession planning at the staff level is critical. Uh, in, in many cases, more critical than uh, which people sit on the board. Because what you have is you're going to always need to have a strong executive director or president and CEO, however the board wants to refer to their person, the staff that's in charge of operations and management. You know, this person sets the tone based on the mission and based on the board's desires, and they run the organization. So you want to make sure that with that, um, that you have a backup. You know, you have that second person that believes in the mission equally, and is a paid staff that is and can become that future backup. Um, and again, talk, I talked about the unexpected with board members, the same thing here. You know, executive directors, if they have to step off or they, you know, they, they fall ill or whatever, you, you, you can't have that time space of a, a, a search. Now you have to have people, you have people on the ground that are working, they're doing programming, they're doing development, they're, you know, so um, we need to, or uh, a board needs to make sure that staff has that same kind of succession planning going on. And also I do think with succession planning, even though, uh, again, I highly recommend having number two in, in place for a long term, it's important, I think, especially at the staff level for the executive director to kind of keep a written manual, if you would, of what they do, who their connections are. Uh, you know, again, you might have, you know, marketing and, and development that, uh, you know, can easily give you some of that, but get it from the executive director's perspective, because again, uh, you know, as they transition or if they have to leave, you want to have a, a playbook out there. That's a really good point. I think we often talk about accounting manuals and processes, and, and we often have all sorts of processes documented, but the executive director really has a very special and unique function to the organization, which um, is often based on soft skills and relationships and um, things that may not be documented. So that, I think that's a really good point. Um, and so one thing I was thinking through as you were talking is, is what should 
the succession plan look like? Should it be a written plan? Is it part of our strategic plan? How do we, is it normally something we just talk about or is it something that we put into some format of this is what the succession plan approach is for this organization and this board? Yeah, I think that a, a good succession plan is a written document and it is part of a strategic plan. So, um, you know, what you want to do is you want to look at, again, the pieces, parts of an organization, you know, both at the board level and at the staff level. And you want to uh, look at the next one, three and five year periods. You know, again, look at the age of people that sit on the board and the age of the executive director and determine with, with through dialogue with them openly, um, what what are your plans? You know, what what do you think that you're going to do? And then incorporate it, you know, use a professional, you know, sit down, have a real strategic plan, uh, have notes taken and develop a, a bona fide written document that you are going, that's goal driven, that you're going to try to live by. And again, succession is a very much so a part of that. And so as we make this succession plan, how often, how often do we revisit this? How often does the board pull this out and say, yes, this is still working or no, maybe we need to change our approach? I think the best approach for almost all nonprofits that we work with, which are big and small, I think that a five-year strategic plan tends to be the most attainable because it's not going too far out in time, but it's going far, uh, far enough out that it allows you to, um, you know, still have the same people in place as you're moving on to the next strategic plan. And that strategic plan, as we talked about a few minutes ago, is going to then incorporate uh, your succession part of that. So again, it's going to lay out um, timelines, goals, you know, financial goals for sure, but strategic more importantly, uh, looking at the fact that, you know, you have maybe a certain size of staff. And, and again, you know, Alex talked about budgeting before. Part of a strategic plan is going to be looking at long-term budgeting. You know, looking uh, again, are you going to have a capital campaign or are, are you going to plan to add a new program that might have some additional, you know, labor costs involved in it. So I think every five years is, is a good uh, gauge for uh, looking at both a succession plan and a strategic plan that kind of oversees that. Thank you, Al. That's great. And I appreciate it. Um, yeah. And so I think that attracting and developing the right leaders, not only in your organization, but um, on your board is, is really one of the keys to success long-term and keeping that um, in your succession planning. And so um, these topics today, thank you, Alex. Thank you, Corliss. Thank you, Al. Um, we're kind of uniquely different, but in a way we're looking at everything in one picture, right? We have the soft skills of our succession planning of what our board looks like. All of this ties into our one, three and our five year plans. We have the budgeting around those things. What are those plans? And then now we're looking at the funding too with Corliss and Raymond James Charitable of, of where are these sources coming from? How are our donors leaving their legacy and how do we build these relationships and make sure that our, our donors are, are happy to do this in a way that leaves their legacy and continues to fund this mission that we care about. So thank you so much for your time. Um, and I think Mary may have some questions there. So we will move over to Mary. Yes, I do have a couple questions here. Um, Corliss, really taking it from the top for donor advised funds. Who was actually setting up the donor advised fund? So if I want to set up a fund for my favorite charity, can I do that? And if I can, how do I connect it? Or does it have to be the actual charity setting it up? How, what direction does that have to start? Very good question. The donor advice fund is set up by an individual or a business. So I, I had a client had, that owned a tire company and he wanted to give back to his community because this community made his tire company very successful. So his business opened a donor advised fund. So an individual or business, and the way you set that up is you fill out the application, complete all the information, fund it, and then you as the individual would then decide what 501c3 charities you want to give a grant to. That's how you connect the charity. If it's a business, 
there's typically one or two authorized individuals from the business to make grants back to the charity. So oftentimes I get the question, do you have a list of donor advised funds that we could ask for contributions? It's really the opposite. It is, I have an account, I make the decision, I, I'm the donor advisor on that account, giving back to my favorite 501c3 charities. And that's how the charity is connected to that particular donor advised fund. Got it. Okay, that makes sense. Uh, and a budgeting question for Mr. Alex. Is there a certain variance level if you are consistently, if you consistently have a certain variance in your budget versus your actual is that a trigger that you need to revisit your budget or is there not a specific threshold you need to hit? Really, why, when would I know this isn't just like a, well, this just happened this year, what are you gonna do? And I actually need to sit down and look at my process for my budgeting. I think historically, naturally, entities either are very conservative in their approach or they're a little bit of aggressive where they don't reach their budget and it's always one or the other. So when you're looking at variance, if it's the same, if it's the same amount from year to year, then obviously we need to re readdress uh, our budget with internal team and then with our, with our board's approval. Um, but a lot of times I would say that that naturally doesn't happen. There's usually that same variance from year to year because we don't revisit that budget. So I think it's very important for, us that if there is that constant variance um, to really look at historical trends, what has happened? Why have we been off? And if, if that historical trend has continued to hold true, then yes, we should absolutely adjust that budget. Got it. Okay. A follow up for Corliss. Does the donor have to? Does the donor have the ability to restrict the funds given to the nonprofit? For example, give to a charity for their capital campaign. For example. You know, that I should have mentioned that. Thank you to whoever asked that question for thinking. The donor advised fund can make grants over to qualified 501c3 organizations. That means the IRS recognizes them as a tax exempt entity. What the IRS will not allow is any gift to release a pledge. I have something that is in writing that is binding that I could present in a court of law to say, I pledge this and this is what we agreed to. So if it's anything that you have, I want my name on the side of my alma mater's new science building and I show the contract, I cannot use my donor advised fund to give back to that particular arranged agreement. I cannot get any benefit from a donor advised fund grant. I can't stroke or uh, request a grant over to a 501c3 and then they say, you will now be the president of the committee. I can't get any personal benefit from a donor advised fund. And the reason is, so the capital campaign, can you give to it? Absolutely. You can say, give to my church, my synagogue, my mosque for the building fund. It's a 501c3 entity in the church, the synagogue, the mosque. And you just want to give it over for general purposes for the charity to make the decision. As long as the charity receives those grants and they get to make the decision, then it's okay. Scholarships are another taboo item. Scholarships say, I wanna give Corliss $100,000 to go to Harvard University. You've awarded me a scholarship. It's a benefit. The IRS says, we've been very generous to you. We don't want you to get any more benefits than what we've already given you. So you cannot get any benefit for yourself or release any pledges or uh, anything in the contract. Got it. Got it. All right, we have one last question and this one's for Al. How do you advertise that you need board members? So I'm a newer nonprofit, where, where do I go? How do I do it? How do I let people know we need board members? Yeah, and thank you. Uh, there's a couple of schools of thought on that. So, I have always been a promoter of with uh, almost any sized um, um, not-for-profit organization to start internally with, again, um, developing what you need. So have the board really discuss what you need as, an, as another board member. And then uh, having the individuals on the board 
reach out for uh, warm referrals through their network. Um, you can, and I have seen it, and it's probably for bigger type of 501c3s, you know, you can say that, you know, the such and such organization is currently seeking board members, uh, specifically looking for people with a strong finance background or a strong marketing background. And then, you know, that's, that's more of a, a cold uh, interview. And again, whether you do the warm or the cold interview, I would for sure have that interview. I would have uh, a group of the board members, probably not the whole board, just a designated group to uh, interview the prospect and to see that they do have uh, the mission as their number one reason for joining. You know, you don't really want people on a not-for-profit board that are doing it because, well, their company says you need to get on a not-for-profit board. You know, you, you want that passion. I think Alex, again, talked about it right out of the gate. You know, you want that passion and you want, uh, again, they have to have the resources, you know, a, a, a time, talent, and treasure. You know, time, can you give the time to the meetings and the uh, uh, and other parts of the organization attending fundraisers, you know? Talent, of course, you know, what, you know, again, whether it's finance, marketing, or whatever, business leader, and then treasure, you know, every, every board, every mission needs to have operational money. So, you know, it's a, can be a give or get. So some people say, well, I can't afford to be on this board, and I've got all the passion in the world. Well, we want you for sure. And so give or get is nice. It's kind of like, you know, we would like you to give personally and or find sponsorships and or members to uh, attain this goal, their goals. You know, again, it, it, it's a combination of everything. So I guess to answer the question in short for again, the advertising or how you reach out, I would start warm and then, and then if you have to go larger. Great. Well, I think that wraps up our questions. So I just want to go ahead and thank everybody again. Corliss, thank you for joining us. From Raymond James, you were absolutely wonderful. Al and Alex, thank you for joining us. Caitlin, excellent job moderating. The next one, you get to run all by yourself. You don't need me anymore. Uh, uh, and thank you to everybody who attended and is listening to our replay. If you'd like to follow up with any of our speakers, I have their email addresses up. And if you're listening to the recording, you can go ahead and uh, rewind. Corliss did give her direct number, which was very generous. And don't forget to sign up for our newsletters uh, by emailing info at corrigankraus.com. And you can also follow us and Raven James on LinkedIn for all the latest news. So thank you everyone again and have a great afternoon. Thank you, Mary. You thank too. you so much. Thank you.